Today, I have the fabulous writer Michelle Gallen with me, whose novel Factory Girls won the Comedy Women in Print Prize 2023, which is so well deserved. And I absolutely loved it. I'm really excited to dive into it today. But before we start, is there anything else that you'd like people to know about you and your work? Oh, dear Lord, people should know how tired I feel right now, um, how much I enjoy oh. <laughs> writing. But seriously, it's hard work. I love it. It's hard work. Yeah. Uh, but no, just yay. Delighted that anybody's here at all listening. Oh, amazing. I actually wanted to start with reading because you have a fabulous page on your website with some of your favorite books. And I know this can be a torturous question for voracious readers like yourself. But um, when you think about people who use humor in their work, are there any particular authors or books that do come to mind for any ages? Oh, any and all. I know that when my kids were little, um, I remember we had to do a lot of the picture books and, you know, you have to do them on repeat. Mm -hmm. So anything that felt even slightly funny was great for me. But I remember discovering Not Now, Bernard. I don't know if you oh, know that one. Yeah. It's a classic. It's that one where the kid's like, basically, mom, can I have attention? Mom, can I have attention? Mom, can I have attention? And then he's like, there's a monster and the monster's going to eat me. And then the monster does. And <laughs> <laughs> like, mm. I, I can't. I can't spoil the ending, but for me, it was brilliant. It was both that kind of book that was speaking to me as the parent who was just constantly going, seriously, I, I've got something to do. Please leave me alone. Mm -hmm. And then the kitty thing. Um, no, I love I love kids' books. Um, I oh, Funny books. There are so many funny books. And Nisha Dolan, a, a fellow um, Irish writer, is her, her, mm. her debut, Exciting Times, was amazing. Um, and then Couples is her latest book, mm. which I have only just started reading, is also fabulous. Um, anyone and everyone shortlisted, longlisted, who's won the published or unpublished Comedy Women in Print Award is also like, I mean, that that's my go-to for picking up my next funny books because their, their unpublished um, list is so exciting. And now that the award's kind of, I think, in its fourth year, we're starting to see the books that were unpublished coming out and having mm. great success. Um, oh yeah, no, I could go on, but I think maybe shush for now and I'll, I'll, I can, I can make more recommendations afterwards on Twitter or something. That's fabulous. I love that. Thank you. And, um, you mentioned the prize there, the Comedy Women in Print Prize. So you were shortlisted and also of one. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. I'd love to know in relation to that, or if you want to bring that out to other prizes as well, you're welcome to do so, but just a little bit of a sense of what that's like behind the scenes because we only see it from this side and see the stickers on the books and see the ceremonies what's it like actually being a writer who's going through that process oh lord well I'm not sure that I'm not sure that writing is fun mm -hmm. <laughs> um I think life can be great fun and hanging out with my friends or my family is, is really really rewarding but like I do know how hard I find it to write my first book Big Girl Small Town although it was still, probably more fun than Factory Girls because it was written during lockdown and it was written in kind of when I didn't get access to face-to-face -face time with my, mm. my family and my friends. And I know that by the time I finished that book and delivered it for, for, for editing or yeah, no, not for printing, I was exhausted and I, I knew I was getting really great feedback on it, but I felt like I'd it, it's not like having had a really great night out where you come home and you're buzzing mm. and you feel great. Like I really felt drained afterwards. And I think I'm trying to manage that better, how to write without kind of decimating yourself. Um, mm. But then, I mean, the upside of that is then it comes out and people are really genuinely like la moved and laughing at it. So mm. I'd been shortlisted for the comedy award, um, comedy women in print award for my first book. And for this one, um, I, I got shortlisted again. I was really excited because for the first time it was again, it was lockdown. So there was like shortlisted and then you find out in Zoom somebody else's one. Um, but the actual shortlisting was so amazing. It was such an exciting thing. But this time I got to go to London, got to go to the mm. Groucho Club and hang out there, which is very frightening place to be it's full of really <laughs> <laughs> it's full of famous people and it's like full mm. of like really smart like you know elegant sophisticated famous people and the problem I had was I'd utterly convinced myself I hadn't won for a range of very reasonable you know the, a, a range of very reasonable things that happened for example nobody told me where the event was or <laughs> what time it started at <laughs> I kind of thought, well, maybe if I won, they would have told me <laughs> to arrive. Um, 
So there were a couple of other little things that I just thought, it's okay, I haven't won. So I'll just drink a load of champagne and have a great time. (laughs) And drank so much champagne that I accidentally, no, I didn't actually mean to drink as much as I did, but somebody else wasn't drinking. And I'm like, you can't let champagne go to waste. And uh, yeah, so I was actually trying to go to the toilet when they announced that I'd won and I I didn't hear this at all I was so fixated on I really need to go to the loo and Mm. so then they announced I'd won and my friends had to tell me that I'd won and they did push me up on stage and I was literally speechless because obviously I hadn't prepared anything um obviously Mm. I'd maybe drunk a little bit too much obviously I was also really shocked and fourth of all I really needed to pee and I was like (laughs) <laughs> this is just not the best situation. I mean, it's amazing, it's fabulous, but also like, oh! so um, yeah, it it was incredible. I think I didn't maybe make the most of like being in such an amazing place and with, around so many like fabulous people, but it, it was really overwhelming, like mm. brilliant, but overwhelming. Like all these legends, like comedy legends, mm. held in letter and all these people that you've grown up like seeing or watching on TV or listening to and seeking out. And they're all just like in the room. I got like a photograph of me and Joe Brand. And I was like, me and Joe Brand, wow. you know? <laughs> so, uh, it, so it, sorry, I'm such a fangirl. Like I don't, I don't, mm. my, my life is mostly a school run and writing quietly mm. in a room. So this was mm-hmm. like. <laughs> I love it. Amazing. And um, the judges, one of the uh, things that's attributed to them in terms of feedback was they said, laugh out loud, funny, grab me halfway through the first sentence, which again was my experience because the voice is so compelling. And um, I wanted to ask you about that. It's never particularly easy asking about voice. But I'm always fascinated by what point of view authors choose because there's so much con- that can come with that choice. And then there's also the constraints. Um, what was that process like for you with Factory Girls? Was that something that was came early that you had to work at? What was that like, the point of view? With um, the so when I started writing the book, it came out in first person. And, hmm. um, and that was really interesting because it was really angry, but alive and vibrant. And, and Maeve's voice was there from the get go. And I kind of sometimes feel not that I'm writing a character, but they're being channeled or something. I know that sounds a little bit mm. spooky, but it really is that mm. my, my characters are f- always to me often feel funnier and braver or more angry or they they feel quite different to who I think I am um mm-hmm. so Maeve came out in first person and I had written 127,000 words of this book <laughs> and I sent it to my agent and as soon as I sent it to my agent I went no oh god no it needs to be third person and I I, mm. I made her um, stop reading it and let me rewrite it in third, which she wasn't excited about because she felt first person was really compelling. Mm. Um, but somehow third person gave this little sense of distance that I think is quite important and maybe allowed it a touch more maturity. And like, I had to be really careful in this because she's quite young, like maybe is 18. I mean, she's really savvy and she knows a lot. She's a, she's an 18 year old who's lived a lot, but she's still young. Mm. Um, but third person give me just enough space to let that voice, let her voice be there, but with a little bit of distance. Um, but yeah, like writing in first person is when I first wrote it, it was, I, I mean, I loved it, but if it, it did feel like being a little bit possessed channeling or something. Mm. Yeah. That makes total sense. And that's so interesting because one of the um, things that I really particularly love about the book and where the humor sits for me is in the descriptions, but like in all in all ways, the descriptions of the characters, of the setting, the mood. And one of the notes that I made to myself is like, this is so interesting because to my mind, it still feels completely in line with like Maeve's worldview, which we don't always get in third person, but in a really beautiful way. But still, then you've got, like you say, that's like distance of third person in terms of how the scenes are set. So that makes total sense because the descriptions are fabulous and and so funny. So I wanted to ask you as well about, um, again, not an easy question, never easy talking about humor in terms of um, big works like fiction, but in the sort of micro level of when you're sort of drafting your scenes, and then also then when you're pulling it out to sort of that macro level of trying to think about the whole shape of the book, what ways do you think um, you think about comedy intentionally when it comes to trying to fix things that aren't working or trying to balance the book? Like what kind of language do you even use in your head to think about the comedy and how it's working? Um, for me, it's like, I don't know, like in real life, I can be funny, but I'm not as funny as yeah. most people I know. Like I, I'm like my, my brother might 
littlest brother said to me, how can you win an award for comedy when you're not even the funniest person in our house? Now, what's funny no. is he's not even the funniest person in our house. We have somebody funnier. <laughs> um, so I, like, my family are really like, quick witted really smart and when mm. I hang out with them I always feel like I'm always like going, I'm definitely the person who's thought of the funny thing an hour later um mm. or you know I'll say something funny on text because I've thought of it and I'll text them and I'm delighted to set my wee funny thing out there and then there's like six other funny things coming on the text whatsapp group afterwards so I think I suppose I I just grew up in a really like in a in a kind of culture, a, a, definitely in a world culture. You know, we're entertaining each mm-hmm. other and having funny conversations, even in the middle of really dark times. It was very important to make people laugh, I guess. Um, and being around that and being slightly terrified because I was never the mm-hmm. funniest person in the room. But I, I I suppose what it is when you write it, you get the chance to do it over and do it over and do it over. And I am mm. someone who drafts things not to death, but it kills me even now when I see something and I know it could be funnier again. And mm. one of the really nice things at the minute is we're working on the adaption of the book for a TV series mm. with Deadpan Pictures. And that means you get to go back into those scenes that are sitting there on the page in print, but you can actually tear them apart and put them back together again. Um, and then you can think about the visual humor. How, how do you things work? Um, how, mm. how something might work from a camera point of view how something works just strictly is it funny as dialogue goes um, so all of that for me I think is really hard work <laughs> mm. um, and definitely in real life I I would love it if I could just keep rewinding my interactions and making them better but you can't you mm. just got to go with what you, what happens or what you've said or done in real life I love that. I've got so many questions I want to ask you, but I'm gonna because you mentioned it, I did want to ask about the TV adaptation and not where it's at in the process. I know it can be such a complicated business. I won't even go there unless you want to. But in terms of uh, you as a writer, are there any different perspectives that adaptation has given you? Because it is its own kind of beast in terms of, like you say, trying to think about how that's going to work visually. Is there anything you think that the process has stimulated in you, um, either as a separate entity or that you're now taking back into your fiction? No, I think so. For this particular adaption, what's lovely is it's giving space for the mother's personality in a much different way to the book. Because in the book, it's Maeve's perspective. And she's kind of writing her mom Mm. off as this, like, depressed old fart. Like, she's just like, why Mm. would I even listen to my mother? Like, what does she even know about life? But, like, everybody who read the book was going, that mother character, she's done, like, they, they could see all the stuff sitting under these little Maeve would dismiss her mom and everybody's like what's her mom's backstory and of course she had this enormous backstory in my head that I couldn't Mm. put in the book without being disloyal to Maeve's perspective so now what's great about the tv series is you get to unpack this kind of angry intense older female character and of course work through Maeve's like own kind of trauma and Maeve's drama and Maeve's excitement um so that's been really interesting that you can give things a completely different focus even while you're still exploring mm. the same narrative even while you've all the same characters just by sh- shifting the medium you can do a very different thing um I love that like I'm, I'm working on the adaption of Big Girl Small Town as well and mm. again that's another one where my first book was really really funny but very like it's almost like a character study like it's deliberately keeps the big heavy plot elements at a distance. Um, the protagonist, uh, Magella, really wants to keep out of the drama, keep out of this kind of murder mystery that's gripped the town. But obviously for TV, you can't just show somebody lying about in bed eating chips, right? <laughs> you have to really <laughs> bring Magella's character and her need for routine and the ordinary and like her, her quiet life kind of into this more exciting... Uh, it, yeah push the plot further forward without shoving her into the background so for all of these things I think it's incredibly hard and how does anybody do this for a living like god it's hard work you know I used to work in tech it was a lot easier a mm. lot easier yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was especially on my list to ask you back so I saw that you worked in tech and I was just curious whether there are any developments in tech that you do find exciting uh, in relation to writing um, because often the things that we currently hear about in the writing landscape with text, it's often with quite a sort of um, fearful lens on. There's lots of 
talk about AI, there's lots of talk about copyright. So I just wonder, because you have um, sort of straddled both those worlds, whether they feel very separate or if you see any things on the tech horizon that you think is actually good for writing or writers. The answer might be no, that's fine. So I am quite geeky and I yeah. do find that if I talk about what I think is looming, then writers get really mm. depressed. I th- yeah. I th- I'm open I think... to it though, because I also work in tech. <laughs> yeah, well, so, I mean, I mean, AI doesn't really care about books and novels and where things come from. Mm. And I think, broadly speaking, neither do most, most humans quite like to get their content for free mm. and when they want it and how they like it. And I think we're going to reach an inflection point quite quickly where AI will be able to not just write the books or write the screenplays, mm. but generate the sorts of things that it thinks people want, want to watch. And of course, it's been mm. trained massively, not just on, you know, library content and books and, and, and music, anything that can be digitized essentially, but also on what, for example, kids have been watching on YouTube for the past mm. ooh, 15, 20 years, is it that we've had kids YouTube? And we have. I don't know, yeah. Yeah, so I'm afraid my whole perspective in this is quite, probably quite dark. But then I also mm. take it that I personally would be very interested to see what AI would design for me. I'm really interested in what it thinks I mm. like, given that it can mm. only ever understand the me that I either feed into the digital world or the me that consumes something digital. So I'm just curious, what would AI make for me? Um, but second of all, I think I always will want to be exposed, just like in my own real life. I love to read certain books. I love TV. I love cinema. And most mm. of all, I love being in the real world with real people. Um, mm. So this is about maybe being really conscious about what your what your actually consumption choices are. I like to spend as much time as possible with real people rather than consuming um, content. And I say that, but real people are exhausting. People are very tiring. <laughs> Daniel, like, they, they really, yeah, no, very, very mm. exhausting people in real life. But then so mm. can, a book can also be exhausting. But the thing is, you can always put a book down and it doesn't freak out. Mm. It doesn't, like, mm. lose its temper because you've walked away from it for a while. So, yeah, I think tech is incredibly um frightening and exciting and is is going to be a massive game changer and i i think maybe most of us don't actually understand the extent to which things are going to change and how fast mm. Mm. It, it's the speed yeah the so speed. I, i'm interested because mm. i'd always rather have the conversation than avoid the conversation uh, and see what's there and have I a don't look know. Uh, I've into become... the dark. No. I've become the person I bec- I I I was having this conversation quite openly and mm. and and particularly the last time I had it with people I I, I yeah I, I felt it wasn't going well and I can understand mm. that because people you know I'm the sort of person who would get in a taxi and go oh you're a taxi driver how do you feel about you know robot taxis <laughs> I mean it's coming now they're already in San Francisco I'll say and they'll go Michelle yeah. this is not how you make friends um, right, not that yeah. you need to make friends with the taxi driver, but maybe you shouldn't say to him, wow, five years before you are, mm. you know, out of mm-hmm. a job, maybe. And mm. it's not going to happen that fast, but there are so many things that will be automated. And what will that mean for us is such mm. a big question. Yeah. And I think it's interesting with humor as well, because I think it, that's such a specific area and I have tested out chat GPT with different bits of humor and uh, and I've seen such a difference in t- today in the like the simple non-fiction tasks I've given it that are akin to like writing a blog post but versus yeah. as soon as I try to move into fiction and as soon as I then try to move into humor we're in a whole different uh, landscape which is both fascinating and gives me hope for human creatives uh, like ourselves too. I would say though chat GPT is basically the sort of I don't know it's kind of like the Jeeves of mm. of of AI and it has been told to be so bland and so yes, servile and so unfrightening because we don't want to frighten people there mm. are and it's also quite old in many ways I think mm. and I'll send you some links um about other chatbots or not chatbots but mm. AI that are writing really incredibly smart 
like frightening mm. things that you would think are being written by really good humans. And this is mm. the space I think. I mean, ChatGPT does a grand old job, right? Of you know, factual, right, you know, write me mm. a book report on I don't know War mm -hmm. and Peace. Off, it'll do it. Mm. Write me a, a job spec for whatever. Even actually, it, it'll write a TV pitch for you. I got mm. it to do a TV pitch for me just to see out of curiosity. Mm. Like I'd been working mm. really hard on a pitch, and I thought, I wonder what it would do. And it did kind of, I would say at the time, we're going back six months, it was probably better now, but like sort of intern level type pitch, mm. you know, mm -hmm. where you're like, oh, good try. But it did, yeah. but it did put in three things in its pitch that I hadn't put into mine. And I went, mm. oh, mm. It's, it clearly has a checklist of things, you know, it's read more TV mm. pitches than me. Of course it has. And it has a checklist of things people might ask. And those three things were things like, oh, well, maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just borrow mm. that. So, mm. and ChatGPT is not the smart one. So, yeah. 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 Mm. Interesting. It's yeah. a good way of putting it, the, the blandness. And like you say, I'm sure that that's only one example. And there's many more. But that's the, such the opposite of your book. Your book um, has such a specificity to it. And um, so many things that I just had this visceral reaction to that were so wonderfully like gross or delightful or sad or poignant that like it just amazing, incredible ways of expressing what things feel like and those tensions and dynamics. So I was curious like whether you ever take things out because you feel like it's gone too far because obviously you're also you're juggling so many interesting pieces and like different people have called it a black comedy or darkly twisted with because there is the, the setting and the troubles in Ireland and mm -hmm. you're d weaving such a beautiful dance between those things as happens in life but were there ever any bits in the book that either for yourself or from feedback from um, beta readers or from editors agents that you took out because you felt like an audience or a reader might not be able to engage it might be too much so we had 127,000 words on the first pass. So like it was yeah. really quite good to be able to chop that. And actually it's very useful for TV because you can go, somebody will say, well, what about this? Like I have already written that scene, you know, that I I kind of have right. so much material sitting there that I can mm -hmm. work with. Um, we did cut things from the book less because we felt, anybody felt the humor was offensive. We had to work very hard I suppose I grew up censoring myself in a way because I did grow up in Northern Ireland. Right. I grew up in a time where, you you know, you had to be careful about what you said and who you spoke to. And mm. even now, I think I still am quite um, protective of, you know, even speaking personally. Um, I mm. let my characters speak and do what they do, but I'm very careful about what, you know, I personally might say about like the conflict or people or things that happened. Um but for Factory Girls, I don't remember taking out anything that people would have found offensive. Um, we did, interestingly, remove um, two non-Northern Irish characters from the book because mm -hmm. um, my editors felt they weren't sufficiently developed to have them in the book. Um, hmm. even though I had this huge story in my head, but partly because we didn't have the space in the book. There's so many themes in the book that we didn't have the ability to develop the kind of what's it like to not be from Northern Ireland and to work in this factory okay. environment, that it's not just that binary between Catholics and Protestants. But like, as they rightfully pointed out, that's a whole book in its own right. You know, to actually give that story the space it requires, you would need to give it a book. It's not, you know, hmm. you can't just have characters that meant a lot to me and had a huge backstory for me but in terms of the book would only have had a very small amount of text um mm. but no I I think one of the hard things about comedy is is that things that we know were okay to say 10 years ago or were considered mm. not too bad 20 years ago suddenly you know as we educate ourselves or as you know tastes change or as culture shifts things that were acceptable or not acceptable and rightfully so. Um, so there's always this, how do you write a book about an historic 1994? It's not like far away history, but 1994 mm. things were quite different. And also in Northern Ireland, they were. So writing things that were really not that nice at the time and come across even mm. harsher now was another thing. So we, we had to keep making sure that that came across in the marketing of the book as well. This is 94. Mm. We have 
you know, girls who've grown up without the internet, who've grown up in a conflict situation, who only know really what their family and their community, what they get from TV and like maybe Blue Jeans or Jackie magazine or what they read in the library. Um, and they're also being kind of manipulated or influenced by the various kind of um, patriarchal figures in, in the book. Mm. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, it's a bit of a dance, right, to try and make sure that you don't make things too sugary or make things for me it's really important mm. not to take things too far away from the truth or from how times were but also not to terrify people to sort of to really like turn a reader off or mm. to lose people because there's like proper messages like I feel like I am trying to share like important themes even if it mm. the work is very very funny you know that absolutely and I so admire the way that you did that as I've read the book multiple times first time just to purely be engaged with that I just I was just absorbed in the world but then because it was so good I had to go back and read it again from I do that I, I do like, how did you yeah. do that yeah. yeah you do that you do the emotional read right you do the read where you just let yourself mm. be the reader or the viewer yeah and then you do the one where you go yeah but hang on a minute how how did how do we switch from this to this? Uh, yeah, I do yeah. that. When it's when it's yeah. technically good, I'm like all over that double reading. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, oh yeah. So uh, fact to be girls, I highly, 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 <laughs> highly recommend it. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, next about you mentioned writing a, a TV pitch recently and having to do that. Mm -hmm. And I also read, so this is winding back a little bit in time, that you uh, went to the Irish Writers Centre Novel Fair. And I had to like part of it. It sounds like was pitching live there. So I wondered if you wouldn't mind if there is any advice that you feel that you do have because that can be quite tough for uh, writers. And I know there's all different contexts for pitching. But for example, I have friends that um, have been to and are going to conferences to pitch to agents and editors. So any advice for taking what's you know a, a big book and trying to put it into a pitch to an agent or editor? So I think there's two parts and. I know that, again, because I've worked in tech and I've done a startups mm. and pitching startups is so much harder than pitching a book. Um, right. And the very first thing that I had to learn about pitching was, you know, it had it wasn't an elevator pitch, right? It was just literally like, how can you get somebody's attention with 10 words? And mm. the elevator pitch is like under 60 seconds. And then you might, if you're really lucky, get five minutes with somebody. And when I say pitch somebody, I mean, you're asking them to give you loads of money. You're not just saying, mm. would you buy my book for 10 quid or 15 quid? You're saying, please, may mm. I have a million pounds um, for this random piece of tech that may or may not work. Um, <laughs> so I had to learn to just get really focused on like, you know, what's my 10 words? Then what's my 60 mm. seconds? What's my five minutes? And I had to learn that, and it's the same. So, so for publishing, it's the same. If you're able to just really quickly give a publisher like one line and then you see something light up, then give them the minute. And then you see something else light, you, you give them the five minutes. And I did that. I mean, I'm like, I know how to write a pitch. I knew how to do it. And I mm. also did a lot of research on the publishers so publishers and agents weren't coming to me and I was like going oh my god my name is Michelle Gullen and here's what I did and here's what I did and here's what I did I'd be all like oh Becky I saw the first book you ever picked up off the slush pile got shortlisted for the booker how are you going to follow that you know like mm -hmm. literally yeah. talking to them about something they'd either said on Twitter something they posted on Instagram, something they'd said in the, 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 the bookseller, but trying to get some in or some sort of way of going, I've actually done my homework here. And mm. it also because like, I know that when you're being pitched at all the time, you know, like, yeah, I suppose you feel a bit like things are bouncing off you. So it's nice if somebody says takes, mm. if you've only got a minute with a publisher, but you've taken 10 seconds to try and connect with them, I think that's quite, quite meaningful. Um, so write your pitch, rewrite it, rewrite it, read it, record it, listen to yourself pitching, do all the research you can on the people you're going to be pitching to. And I think the, the biggest lesson though, from tech was like, I got told that you haven't had no answer unless you've emailed the person 10 times. 
Mm. Um, so this idea that you would go, hi, sent you my book. And I was just wondering if you read it. And then they don't get back to you and go, hi, so I sent you my book. I really thought the weather was bad. Did, did you read my book? And then you do it again. You go, mm. hi, I know that you didn't get back to me the last couple of times, but you're not doing it passive aggressive. It's literally like, you know, mm. they're super busy. You know, they're super tired. You know, everybody's overwhelmed. But you're that mm. polite, determined person who's going to stick at getting their book out there. So, yeah, I actually, I think I wrote a, a blog post series about this once about mm. how to write your pitch, how to research your market, really listen to advice and, you know, practice, 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 practice. Um, I don't know. It, 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 it's hard work. It, again, it's hard work. I love it, though. I really enjoy do you? it. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Oh. I just love I just get excited. I'm like, here's this book and I actually think mm. this book's going to be great for you and I think people are going to love this book and I can see in my head the sort of person who's going to read the book or where it would fit. Like I'm not the BBC mm. book at bedtime because of all the bad language, but um mm. I can be the abridged, you know, we series where people go, "Oh my god, that's terrible, but now mm. I'm going to buy the book because there is a lot of swear and there'd be mm. more in the book." Um, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, that's fabulous. But that, what a great energy to do it from. Irresistible. And yeah. I did actually watch the keynote that you um, that's on your website um, because you're such a fabulous public speaker too. And I found it fascinating because the theme you were talking about there that I found compelling was failure. And um, you shared different personal stories to do with that. And I think it's such an interesting uh, theme because it's so inherent to being part what well, to be whether it's, you're an entrepreneur or a creative <laughs> um so I'm just wondering currently as a human and a writer um how do you think about failure if you do you might be like oh that's a depressing question for a Tuesday no but it's not I found it's, it helpful I we've just renovated our house I know I think I whinged about that before we um before we went live but um when like we moved into Victorian not Victorian but like you know Victorian era house but it's literally like all they'd done to it was fix windows and like nailed some like surface wiring to it so we really, really were living in like a Victorian era house and we've had it renovated and that means the wiring's all tucked away and like the floors are all shiny and there's lots of paint everywhere mm. and I swear to god like it was at no point was it perfect but at least at one point nobody had like knocked lumps out of the the paintwork so literally like when we were bringing our furniture back in it got chipped like things got chipped and I'm trying to sit with that whole idea that you know you know we're all just sort of atoms and we're brought together in whatever form we're brought in like human or table or like I don't know ocean tree um and we do end up falling apart again um and I I, I try to take this big huge big picture sort of perspective on these things because mm. um it's so stressful if you st you know sweat the small stuff it's really really hard and in terms of like coming to my work and thinking about failing I think failing in tech helped me a lot in the sense that that narrative in tech is never that you failed or maybe your product has failed but you mm. haven't failed that as long as you're up and you've more ideas then you're going to get out and do it again then you're not a failure you've you've only learned lessons and I think it's very relevant to art because unlike mm. many things that like you write a book and people say it's great and then you can write another one and they might say it's terrible you know, or it might mm. bomb or it might be the wrong time or, you know, something could have happened that wipes like COVID can happen and wipe your book out. Um, and so the other thing that keeps me kind of on my path is always looking at the process and not the product. So although I'm a very product person, I would like to write a funny book that tells the story and, and I can see the niche in my head. The other side of it is like to actually feel like I'm sitting down and doing a sentence that matters, that then turns mm. into a paragraph that matters, that then turns into a scene that matters, that then even if it is only read by one person somewhere and even if the person's only my husband, although he doesn't really read my stuff, um, that mm. this matters. And I think, so that kind of like the process of being a human who is creating is really mm. important. Um, and you're never failing if you're creating, right? Like you, like you, if, if you're actually creating, that's winning or that's succeeding, whether the product whether the book, whether the movie, whether the TV series succeeds or not is not entirely within your control. It really isn't. Um, but doing the work is. I love that. And that's so beautifully said and so encouraging. Um, 
Thank you. And as we record this, just a couple more questions. It's uh, end of August, so we're moving into the autumn, winter. Do you know what the rest of the writing year looks like for you? You say you've been busy doing kinds of things, renovating your house and whatever, but how far ahead do you like to think with writing? Is it deadlines? Is it freedom? No, I I have two books I'm trying to finish so I um one of them at the minute is on fire book number four I think of it as and unfortunately that's not the book that everybody wants me to deliver they want me to deliver book number three but book number three okay. I know that I need to do it but I want to switch I come a bit Wurzel gummage like I need to plop the heads on to do it so I want to just finish the first draft of book four which I think mm -hmm. is in a really good place and then I'm going to go back to book three where actually I wrote the book and now I want to introduce this whole other plot into what is quite a loose world. And the plot would be the, the sort of engine of the book, I guess. Like it's, it's, so it's something very structural that I want to do to it. So I want to go back to that. I'm working on both the TV adaptions and really I've had this very disjointed year of not living in my house and living in my house, like, like mm. you know, essentially being homeless while not being homeless, like li literally going, where are we going to sleep tonight? Oh, we've a camper van. We'll be fine. Um, and then moving back into your home and being like, I don't have a desk, you know, I don't have things set up. We don't mm. have proper beds or anything. And the kids are going back to school this week, which, you know, kids back in school just means that there's hours in the day where you can sit down and go, that's it. I'm switched on right now. I'll get my work done. So mm. yeah, I guess I need to just, advantage of all any energy <laughs> any energy mm. and any time and make what I can happen um but yeah I'm quite excited about my work I keep saying to my husband you know if I could just live in a hotel and have people bring me food and stuff then be no problem right and I'd be absolutely fine so that's the, that's <laughs> yeah. the dream you see you know yeah. Virginia Woolf's always like oh you need a room of your own and like well, in mm -hmm. fairness, if you saw her life, like she had like, you know, butlers and servants and stuff, it's not really mm. a room. What you actually need is just room service, like of mm. your own, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, somebody to change the towels and the sheets and like to bring you up the breakfast, lunch and dinner. And then a wee gym with a swimming pool or something like that's yeah. more room service for writers. Yeah, I love it. I love it. You've got it all covered because I was just like, oh, too much room surface. And I, oh, I might have to, you know, but then you've got it covered if there's no, a gym and a swimming gym, pool as well. Gym, it's a perfect pool setup. And a bit of a garden. Yeah. And I'm sure you'd have yoga mm. classes and all. No, I, seriously, mm. if I ever win the Euro Millions, um, I'll set up a wee writer's, writer's hotel and just do all of that. I, lo I, oh, I love it. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> And um, just before we end, I'd love to know, is there any sort of parting advice for other uh, writers who are also interested in comedy and interested in fiction? Because um, this po this podcast, I interview people from all walks of life in comedy, because I think it's all relevant and we can learn from lots. But there isn't so much discussion around fiction and comedy. Um, there is more in rom-com, also awesome, but that's its own uh, particular kind of genre. And uh, that's not what your book is, even though there are lovely relationships in it. So I'd love to know for people who are I, out there working on that. I'm not, so I feel that I'm not structured about what I read and what I take in because my number one influence is yeah. the real world. So my, my number one thing is uh, if you're trying to write comedy, are you are you like I mean I did a stand-up course at one point and it, like I was crap at it but mm -hmm. I learned an awful lot about a how hard it is and b how mm. do you pull material out of something c you know how close something might be to you so one of my problems with stand-up was it was just simply mm. like it requires you to give so much of yourself rather than channeling mm. like a character like the stand-up at least in my course it was very much like what what's what's in your life right now that we could all laugh at and plenty you know but I felt a bit weird about giving that away to an audience full of people whereas I don't have a problem doing that with my friends and family like I really enjoy mm. sitting down with them and talking and laughing and bringing things up from years ago um but I also find even sitting on my right so this is so random right but today I was like really hungry and I was like feeling mm. sorry for myself and I was like going what do you want to eat and I was like cornflakes and I thought, I don't just want one bowl of cornflakes, I want two. And mm. and then I didn't have two bowls of cornflakes like out of the same bowl. I poured 
two separate bowls of cornflakes <laughs> and see how that's funny why is that funnier is funny. why is that yeah. funnier than eating two bowls of cornflakes eating two bowls mm. of cornflakes is kind of weird but pouring two mm. separate bowls of cornflakes and then eating mm-hmm. them one after another is somehow way funnier and mm-hmm. I think there's things like that that literally I I think you can watch a lot of funny tv and funny movies mm. and read a lot of funny books it's this idea that how can you distill your own life into why is two bowls mm. of cornflakes funny? I mean, if you literally were doing a scene where there's no dialogue, but somebody did that, you'd be like, what a freak. Who does mm. that? And <laughs> it's that idea that you can sit on the train or you can be in the pub or th- that you're just constantly going, Gee, why is that both noteworthy and maybe mm. weird or really touching you know there's all these mm. things that you just mm-hmm. see and your heart breaks or you're like oh my god mm. um so I'm always just I feel like a wee hoover like hoovering up all all these things mm. even just on a really boring day where I'm feeling sorry for myself and I need cornflakes I now know I have to use the tuple of cornflakes things summer mm-hmm. in some work somewhere um totally that's not very oh. structured that's literally saying hoover no, it all great. up Hoover it all mm. up, all of it. I love it. I, that's absolutely perfect. That's a perfect place to end. Um, so where can people go to find out more about you and your work? Okay, so michellegallon.com is my website. And my brother, Decky, keeps saying he's going to help me update it again. Because although I'm really geeky, he's much better at selling me. Because my first ever website, mm. which was michellegallon.com, had a picture of a succulent in a little plant pot and this really sad right. biography me and, and my brother Jackie looked at mm-hmm. him he's like Michelle like no so my website has all the ways in which somebody can like find my work um contact me stalk me uh but basically anything you need is there but I do need to update it with more of the things that I've been doing but I just keep going why aren't you doing the real things Michelle like living and eating cornflakes two bowls at a time in your kitchen that's mm-hmm. brand new brand new kitchen so yeah, yeah. michellegallon.com is where it all begins <laughs> perfect I'll put that in the show notes thank you so much what a delight to be able to talk to you and thank you for your fabulous funny and heartbreaking books too thank you so much for having me Danielle it's been a pleasure okay thank you